This is Joshua English for the Alameda County EMS Audio Podcast. big difference in people who may be living with this disability for many, many years. And we just sometimes need to, I think, remind ourselves, myself included, that these relatively small disabilities have huge impacts. In this episode, we have special guest Jay Goldman, an ER physician with Kaiser. He is also the EMS liaison for Kaiser Northern California. Jay is in conversation with Jocelyn Freeman Garrick, Alameda County EMS's assistant medical director and EMS fellow, Dr. Sanai Kidani. We also hear from Mike Jacobs, pre-hospital care coordinator with Alameda County EMS. Emergency medicine is moving more and more toward providing specialty care sites for certain patient conditions like cardiac arrest centers that provide comprehensive post-resuscitation care cardiac receiving centers that provide comprehensive interventions and rehabilitation for patients suffering from MI, trauma centers and stroke centers, just to name a few. Well, in this episode, we are going to focus on the rising importance of stroke centers here in Alameda County and their effect on the community, especially those areas of the community where stroke is disproportionately affecting the lives of people of color. Jay Goldman is an ER physician who works at Kaiser Hayward and Kaiser Fremont. Kaiser Fremont has recently attained JCO certification as a stroke center, and Kaiser Hayward is close to finishing the process. We now have four designated stroke centers in Alameda County, Washington Hospital, which is also in Fremont, Alta Bates in Berkeley, as well as a summit campus in Oakland. Over the next 20 minutes, we will highlight the benefits of having these centers in our communities and what can be further accomplished as we move forward. Jay Goldman. Stroke is the third leading cause of death in the U.S. It accounts for approximately 150,000 deaths a year. And for many years, medicine has played a pretty passive role in the treatment of acute stroke when patients uh, would arrive in the emergency department. We would wait for complications to occur. We would treat them once they would occur. But we didn't take a very aggressive approach like we have for the last decade or two. Dr. Jocelyn Freeman Garrick. Well, we understand the pathophysiology of a stroke, but the problem is it's not as clear cut, um, say, for example, with chest pain. In the 80s and early 90s, uh, public health um, had a major campaign, so most lay people in the United States know that if you're having left-sided chest pain, radiating down your arm with numbness and tingling, you might be having a heart attack. Um, but with stroke, it could be more subtle. It could be just the difficulty with speech or your hand grip, um, not dense, hardcore findings like someone is immediately paraplegic. So a lot of education needs to occur on that end, and that makes it more challenging. A significant factor in caring for people suffering from stroke is when they access the 911 system. Which is the key for us, because now we know we have interventions that if they occur in a time-sensitive period, can reverse uh, the acute ischemia and lead to better outcomes and quality of life for the patients. Another important factor is for the field to recognize the signs and symptoms of stroke. Mike Jacobs. You know, those patients that have officially diagnosed TIAs have a higher risk for occlusive stroke. Those with, um, you know, past history of diagnosed uh, single or even multiple occlusive strokes have a higher index for hemorrhagic stroke. And I think that that really plays into the key as well for our paramedics to get good history as well as their physical findings. And probably two of the two of the big guys that seem to be stumpers for our guys in the field would be that of acute hypoglycemia, which can mimic stroke. Uh, that's numero uno. And the other one would be uh, uh, you know a facial droop from palsy. Um, those are the two that kind of can, can hang these guys a left turn sometimes and may be a little problematic. But with good risk stratification and and uh, you know a good, good valid time stamp from someone, a uh, patient last seen normal. Those things are, are really key, and then getting them to the right place. Dr. Sanai Kadani. Um, EMS comes in because we um, um, have the option to transport the patient to a certain destination, where they can receive these treatments in a timely fashion. Uh, with that being said, um, there have been no studies that show that a diversion policy from EMS. 
um, can improve outcomes uh, one way or the other. Uh, what we do know is that the designation of a stroke team um, that responds to a patient in a timely fashion, um, coordinated multidiscipli multidisciplinary uh, interventions in the hospital setting, coordination uh, between EMS, uh, the emergency department, laboratory services, radiology services, neurosurgeons, um, all of that coordinated in a timely fashion can improve patient outcomes and decrease um, uh, complications from a stroke. Um, our goal is that in all, all hospitals in our region become stroke, designated stroke uh, centers with dedicated stroke teams that respond to patients in a timely fashion. Um, until all our hospitals can uh, bring themselves to this level of service, uh, we have a choice to transport our patients to hospitals that can provide this service. Again, Dr. Jay Goldman. One very mundane but practical and important piece that actually uh, came to mind while I was working in the emergency department last week was the tremendous impact it has when the, when the squad mednets us that they're bringing in a possible stroke patient. You know, we try to greet the paramedics when they bring patients in, but sometimes at all emergency departments we're busy and it, I may or may not be able to see them when they first come in. When I hear that they're bringing in a stroke patient, I extricate myself from a room. If I'm doing something that would take a long time, I could almost always get out of it. I can greet them there. And so I can make the decision as to whether or not we have to activate the whole stroke center business immediately and not five or ten minutes later and not have to wade through various other discussions. I can get it right then and there by talking to the crew and talking to the patient. And literally, it's a 30 to 60 second time frame to make a decision. Though definitive care is important, more needs to be done to educate the public, especially in those areas where health equity is an issue. I mean, that gets back to the public health piece, and that's a challenge across the country um, for everyone. It's education, education, and how do you relay the message to the community with a complex disease. EMS can play a role in that, however, with the chronic patients that we see. We know there's high recidivism among our patients who are dialysis patients, who are chronic hypertensives and diabetics, who are the ones who are most likely to suffer from acute ischemic stroke. And we are trying to do that in Alameda County, and that's what's exciting about our county is that we're not just practicing the policies and uh, overseeing our transport providers, but we're actively engaged in research and education. So we're doing it asthma education now, and one of the next steps would be uh, stroke education regularly when we're transporting patients to get involved in the education piece. Again, Dr. Goldman. I, gotta tell, I think that's critical, and I think that the closer we can connect EMS to public health efforts like that, around across the board we're going to see improvements. If the more paramedics can talk to patients, some of whom they've seen several times, mm -hmm. about getting follow-up for high blood pressure, or, uh, you know, if they know anything about cigarette cessation programs, I'm not suggesting that in the ambulance we're going to get people to stop smoking, but we might be able to talk to patients about saying you can get help, um, controlling their diabetes. The more we can do that, I mean, the, the idea is to put the stroke centers out of business by not being, I mean, of course that's not going to happen. We'll always have strokes, but we want, we want to prevent these, and I think the efforts that Jocelyn's talking about are absolutely critical, and I think they're the future of EMS. Stroke centers provide a coordinated, team-focused effort. So that we can get to patients quickly, we can get the right people, the right team to patients quickly to make decisions quickly about patients, because there's really two phases to stroke care. One is this very acute phase that we've all sort of been talking about. Can we do something to interrupt the stroke right now? And we have to make those decisions very quickly. And we need a team to be able to do that and to actually deliver all the components of that intervention quickly enough for them to have an effect. So that's one. After that acute phase is over, there's really then, then you've got the really difficult part, the long-term recovery from stroke. And it turns out that there's evidence that stroke center, the care provided at stroke centers with that team approach produces better outcomes. So both in the acute setting, where you can maybe intervene, and in the late setting, where you can always do something, it seems that the, the this sort of integrated approach of a stroke center is 
beneficial to patients. Again, Dr. Garrick. We use the Joint Commission. They come in and do a lengthy certification process, and it's not just the acute treatment. Most of the variables and the outcomes that they're evaluating are actually longer-term outcomes and morbidity while they're in the hospital. These centers that are certified have less a decreased numbers of people who aspirate. Uh, they're getting therapy immediately, like speech therapy and evaluations. Um, so all of that, that comprehensive approach, plus immediately after and a year after they're having better outcomes is, is why they fare better than someone just going to a, a local emergency department. Again, Dr. Sunai Kidani. Spe specifically, they look at things um, things like uh, time to thrombolytics, time to aspirin administration, um, time to lipid lowering agent, um, time to CT, time to CT read, um, uh, coordination of ancillary services, whether the patient re received rehabilitation, um, uh, as well as measures to decrease complications from a stroke, like. Um, uh, DVT prophylaxis and uh, prevention of pneumonia and aspiration pneumonia. So these are all the things that the Joint Commission looks at as well as monitors um, uh, throughout a, a uh, certification process. The process to become certified is completely voluntary. Um, not all um, jurisdictions use the Joint Commission process to establish a stroke center. Some um, states have their own certification process. Dr. Goldman. You know, uh, Certainly a hospital theoretically could provide the same quality care without the certification, but there's no way that we would know that. There's no way you can judge their quality. So the Joint Commission certification or a state-sponsored or EMS-sponsored certification serves as a proxy to say, yeah, we've gone through all those steps, we've met these criteria, we can provide this quality of care. And without that, you just don't know. So it's not like the other places are, may not be doing a good job, but it's very difficult to know that. And that's the advantage of having a well-understood certification program. In Alameda County, we're trying to take an integrated approach, community education, provider education, and ensuring that our stroke centers meet the highest standards the industry has to offer. These are, these are all critical components of a system that you look at at the same time. Um, people need to know what to worry about in terms of their symptoms and when to call 911. Providers need to know how to recognize patients who need to go to the stroke center as compared to patients who are better off staying local where their families can spend more time with them if they're not having an acute stroke. Um, rapid transport is part of any EMS system. Um, intervention we talked about. And, you know, on the money side, I think the bang for the buck is in prevention. You know, once the stroke occurs, we'll spend what we have to spend to make people better, but we want to prevent it. Focusing on EMS's impact to the community, there is one aspect of EMS's involvement in this system that may be a little counterintuitive. There, there have been, over the last 10, 15, maybe even 20 years, study after study after study that show in urban settings the advantage of Code 3 transport almost never justifies the risk. And I want to be really clear that we're focusing on these rapid interventions for stroke patients. If we get a patient to a stroke center four or five or even six minutes faster, which, by the way, is almost never going to happen by going Code 3, it will not make a difference in their outcome. And from my point of view, transporting these patients code three is a risk that is not worth taking and doesn't benefit the patient, period. Well, I completely agree with you on that and think we just need to do more education for our transport providers. Because even if you want to get more technical with the lights and sirens in the code three and having these patients as calm as possible while we're transporting, um, you can say has a factor. But I think if you can just get them there safely um, and as efficiently as possible, the lights and siren in this setting doesn't really make a difference. What does make a difference is early recognition on behalf of the field provider. Again, Mike Jacobs. You know, what about the patient that has history of stroke and today's just not feeling well and having problem with their vision and having a small vessel stroke, you know, that may not be picked up. And I think that this this integration of continued education for the public as well as our providers would help with our catchment in, in picking up these patients that may have gone unnoticed by their families as well as by the paramedic possibly. Again, Dr. Jay Goldman. One comment is that you know paramedics and emergency docs are accustomed to seeing really bad things and we can get a little jaded to 
things that aren't quite so severe, like so-called small strokes. And I think what this can help remind us is that patients who have had even small strokes and who, quote, only, quote, have a limp on the left leg that they never had before, you know, that's a real disability. And that's a real life changer. And anything that we can do to either prevent the stroke to begin with, to decrease the impact of the stroke, or to improve the rehabilitation makes a real big difference in people who may be living with this disability for many, many years. And we just sometimes need to, I think, remind ourselves, myself included, that these relatively small disabilities have huge impacts on people. A small limp could mean big problems for older adults. It also mean they lose their job. could also mean they don't drive. could also mean they then become more isolated. I mean, you know, these are relatively, in the big picture, small things compared to what we all see. But they have huge impacts on people. If we can throw the ball for a minute to the public health side and those people who, whose job it is to take care of these patients before they have a stroke, if we could make sure that, that, that the clinics are available, that blood pressure control is available, that primary care is available for all the citizens of Alameda County so that we can prevent, we can reduce the risk factors that result in an increased incidence of strokes. And we need to control those things months and years before these events happen. You've been listening to the Alameda County EMS Audio Podcast. This is your host, Joshua English. You can download this and past episodes of this podcast on our website at acgov.org forward slash EMS. You can also download our iPhone application, which has access to our county protocols, as well as very important phone numbers to contact our hospitals. Thanks for listening.